So anyways, welcome to the conversation. Uh, we, we thank you. In front of you, hopefully you will have a couple of documents. Uh, there is a presentation that Tim has been kind enough to put together. Um, there's a worksheet there. And probably most critically, you also have a feedback form. And we really want to hear uh, anything that, that we can do to make our programming stronger. If there are events or speakers that you would like us to invite to this conversation, topics uh, that we should be sharing, please tell us. Tell us how well we did today. Uh, and we really value your feedback. Uh, we use that feedback to make our program uh, stronger. So with that, uh, let me just set up our, our next couple of activities and then we'll hand the baton over to uh, Tim. So Tim, if you could go to the presentation. Um, so next month, we are, if we can flip to the next slide. Um, next month, our speaker is going to be, thanks to uh, Shannon and the team in Aurora, uh, Bob Stevens is going to be talking to us. Um, obviously, as you see, our popular media, there is a lot of volatility in the business space. Um, a lot of litigations coming across for a variety of reasons. So he's going to be talking about how, you know, what are some, how do we think about ethical behavior? How do we think about legal risks? Uh, steps that business owners can take to avoid really missteps. So please join us for that. That will be on September 20th from 12 to 1. Uh, and please reach out to your local chamber leaders for more details there. Uh, next slide. Uh, based on your feedback, something else that we are launching next month is a business uh, uh, economics book club. It's going to be a six-week event, free for your, uh, you to participate in. The book is called Economic Facts and Fallacies. The reason we're having this conversation is because based on the feedback that many of you provided, uh, there's an interest to know more about how what are what does local economics mean? What what's the what are the facts? What is the reality? What's hyperbole? So we've picked this first book. Uh, we hope you can join us. It will we'll work through the book relatively quickly. Um, you can see the dates there: September fourth, eleventh, eighteenth, twenty fifth, October second and 9th will be our events. We will be. Um, this is Tuesdays. Uh, each uh, each Tuesday, it's from six to seven p.m. Uh, it'll be a virtual session, so what you do need is a computer uh, with a good audio system and a video system so we can, uh, we can sort of collaboratively virtually meet. Uh, we'll be reading about 40 pages each week and then discussing uh, our findings, discussing how we apply some of those learnings to our, our own small communities. If you are interested in joining us, please, uh, on the sheets, the feedback sheets that are in front of you, you can write down your name your email address, uh, and, and tell us that you're interested and we'll be sure to invite you. So with that, uh, let, me, let me introduce Tim Smith. Tim is, we're very, very fortunate to have Tim. If you can go to the next slide, Tim. Tim, uh, Tim brings 30 years of experience in uh, media, uh, advertising. Um, he is an award-winning journalist. Uh, he is absolutely a digital media expert. Uh, he's served over uh, a decade uh, serving as the uh, managing uh, sort of director of marketing and operations for a variety of organizations. So lots of experience there. He currently works for Philips Media. It's a newspaper publishing company and, um, and really responsible for building readership, building audiences. So he knows a lot. He's done a lot of research. He has uh, a vast accumulation of experiences. So he'll be sharing some of his experiences with us today. And, um, and his goal for today is to really open your eyes and inspire you to the art and science of marketing um, and thinking and hopefully give you some very practical tips on how you can go back and, and apply some of those learnings. So, so again, uh, hopefully you have the printouts in front of you. And without further ado, I'll, I'll hand the baton to Tim. And Tim, if you want to go into your full screen mode so folks can see you, um, welcome. Thank you, sir. That is uh, quite a introduction. I really appreciate that. I am uh, I'm an employee of Phillips Media Group, but you probably know us in Buffalo as the Buffalo Reflex. Um, my mom is the Fairgrove correspondent and has been for 40 years, and I have great memories as a kid running around that original printing press. 
We are also uh, proud to own the Marshfield Mail is one of our Phillips Media newspapers. And I believe that our printing plant in Springfield prints newspapers in Dent County. So Aurora is not the one that is the only town that uh, we're joined by this morning that I don't have a direct relationship, but here's something that I do know about Aurora and I am proud to share. If you guys have not eaten out there on Elliott Street in the little red trailer, El Taco Zone is delightful. They are the best. Have the burrito, have them fix it the way that they would eat it because these people, they are geniuses when it comes to food. Little bitty trailer, Elliott Street. You heard it here first. So let's talk about what the uh, objective of this morning's uh, presentation is going to be. And it's not just an objective, it's a lot of object objectives. And it's everything that you think about when you're thinking about marketing. You wanna create awareness of your product or service and you wanna be able to speak directly to a buyer. You wanna learn how to engage an audience and you wanna be able to create relationships that develop buyers. You wanna research the influencers who are already engaging that audience of buyers in other places. You wanna create memorable conversations, you wanna build trust, you wanna narrow the sales funnel. These are all buzzwords. If you've done any reading of any books about marketing and sales, these are all buzzwords that, that you know the meaning of. What you then need to do when we hopefully make you a little, a little more aware of a great audience to start developing relations with is to learn how to listen for buying signals across different generations and how to get them to the point that they're going to, to be a sales target. You want to be able to engage this audience, you want to be able to track this audience, and you want to be able to get feedback from this audience that makes you even better on the next sale with that particular buyer or buyers that they may influence or may in the process introduce you to. So what we're gonna do is gonna cover a lot of ground. So let's talk about what targeted marketing is and isn't. It is having a specific customer in mind. It's great that you want to sell to everybody. That is impossible. There's 7 billion people on the earth right now. You can't hit all 7 billion. So thinking that you're going to reach everyone, however big everyone is, everyone in the city that you're in, everyone in the county that you're in, everyone in a six county area, try to have one specific person and have a biography in mind for that person so that you can know that the conversation you're having is gonna cut through the clutter that may be happening in that person's mind or life. Once you have that person, then you need to know who is in that person's network and know that that audience that you are developing is gonna be worth the time and effort and the cost potentially to be able to develop that set of sales leads. So if you're not going to go through the effort to create an audience that is not somehow going to convert into a sale or is not part of influencing people that are going to be part of a sale, you're wasting time. And life is too short and you've got too much to do at your day job to be able to afford to waste time. So remember that every little interaction is part of the sum of interactions that lead to dollars on the ledger. You need to know the demographics of the buyer. If you have that one person in mind, you need to know approximately what their age group is, what their generational values are, what they tend to buy, how much money they have in their pocket, and how often they buy. This, this, is, this is marketing 101. When you are able to do your end of your week sales, end of the quarter, end of the year, you're gonna have a pretty good idea over who your top 5% of your buyers are and who the bottom 95% are. I'm asking you to widen the scope of what your research is internally to 10%. Focus on 10%, understand those people intimately, and then develop the next 10% after that. Don't resort to something that's gonna be quick or easy or it's gonna be high calories, low nutrition. So stop thinking about gimmicks, stop thinking about bundling or uh, lost leads, stop thinking about things that are gonna burn out and not make your brand stick in the mind of your buyer. This is about developing relationships that develop sales frequency. You also need to have feedback mechanisms in place and those feedback mechanisms need to be ethical and they need to be transparent. They need to be honest and you need to monitor them on an almost real time basis. You have to stay up 24 hours a day and make sure you address every comment on Facebook. No, you don't. You don't have to answer every Twitter post if you have a Twitter account. 
but you can't let the thing lie there for a week. In fact, with the younger audiences, you can't let it lay there for more than 24 hours. They're, they're already moved on. They've already broken up and they're looking for someone else that they can develop a relationship with. On the far side of that though, don't be gathering information that is intrusive or makes you seem creepy. If you are instantly on top of every conversation, then somebody's gonna think that somewhere in a cigar box, you've got a lock of their hair. Nobody wants that, so don't, don't be that person, okay? So, who are we gonna define as our target for target marketing? Well, let me hey, tell Tim. you something. There's a $200 sorry, million right? dollar audience that Tim. probably knows nothing about you. You're gonna to need to research pop culture. If you're gonna to talk to this audience, if you're gonna be part of this $200 billion in purchasing decisions in the United States, you're gonna to need to start being fluent in pop culture from 1995 to 2015, and I'm gonna show you why here in a bit. Tim? You need to assume that this buyer that we're gonna be researching and developing relationships with is too busy for you and too busy for anyone else. And we're gonna explain that in a second. So we need to learn more about social media, which is the purpose of the worksheet that we sent you. We want you to be able to sit down when you have a couple of minutes and basically audit what you're doing on your computer or device. We need you to learn how to be authentic, and we're gonna give you some ideas on how to do that. We need for you to be able to develop a brand that shows that it can be responsive and it can be kind because in this era of new media and social media, everybody sees everything all the time everywhere. So once we learn this culture, once we learn these technologies, then we're going to also learn to be patient because this is a customer that is a human being after all. And as social as we are as animals, we still want to be able to make our own decisions and feel like that we are creatures of free will. So who is this audience? Well, they are millennials. We've all heard jokes about millennials, but guess what? One quarter of the workforce right now, are people between the ages of 18 and 34. These are people that have had internet their entire lifetime. They've either had the squawky dial-up internet that people my age remember having, having gotten knocked off the phone so you can check AOL, or they've had a device in their hand. They do not know a life without the internet, period. So this is the most connected generation of buyers that you're ever going to meet and they've always had instant access to information. They don't know what it's like to have an unanswered question because in their lifetime, they've always had Google. Google has always been there. These are people that have grown up in a generation where they are holding each other mutually accountable, sometimes to standards that are too high to meet. So they are very value-minded because they can research pricing in real time, and they are very values-minded because they are building tribes in real time. They seek out influencers among their peer group. So if you find their friends, you find them. You go to their cave because you have followed their friend to where they congregate. This is a group that because of the, the feedback that they are constantly getting from their peer group, the values that they are constantly seeing being tested and on display, and because of the value they're always finding, they're dubious of everything, of everyone. You can't fool them. They're gonna check out every source that you give them. So we're gonna help this customer form opinions based on a variety of facts from their most direct influencers. Reach the friend, reach the person. So once you find that influencer, once you find that sales target, it becomes a diet. It becomes a conversation between you and the sales target. This is me and you. This is not a folks conversation. This is not mass communication. There's still a place for places like newspaper publishing, television, radio, billboards, there's still a place for that because you've got to do brand awareness. But once it gets to the point where you're going to target this person to take money out of their pocket and put it into your pocket, you're talking to one other person. So millennials, when they are developing value and looking for folks that have their same values, they're going to be most attracted to a cause. And the cause can be anything from puppies and pets to uh, saving the ozone. So whatever your cause is, whatever your business can uh, defend as its cause and believe in is gonna be something that you wanna identify first. When you are talking about your business, good or bad, you gotta be transparent. 
You don't have to share everything, but when you do share, make sure that you are doing so in a way where people can see where you are and feel like they have that one-on-one -on -one conversation directly with you, the business identity. And the easiest way to do that, as we've seen in exemplary fashion, is to be funny and a casual manner and to be authentic in a way that nudges someone rather than smacks them around in the face. So the whole dress for dinner, if you know the metaphor, if you know that you're showing up for a dinner party, the first question you ask is how do I dress for this room? Well, the ability to be part of that audience means that you want to appear to be an influencer. When you are able to be transparent and you're able to build rapport, then you need to understand what the rules of that dinner party are going to be because that's basically what social media is. It is the world's largest dinner party. So if you're going to be able to engage this audience and you're going to be able to use humor, you want, you, you want to be able to develop a brand that has fun. You want to be able to have a personality that doesn't take life too seriously. And once you get to the point where you develop that rapport, you develop trust, you're at the point where you're ready to create a sale, then you want to make that purchasing process effortless. Once someone receives your package, if this is a good that you're selling or if this is an invoice, you want to make sure that everything that you say on the packaging or everything that you say on the invoice is true. And if it's something that is hard to understand, then go back a step so that you can make that next purchasing inter interaction as effortless as possible. And if it happens to be something that is not easily understood, make sure that you have feedback mechanisms so that people can ask you questions and share their frustration. Um, this last one is something that even, even uh, internally we we deal with and that's the eat your own dog food and and like it if if you are not able to have a brand that you believe in then you're not going to transparently communicate to your buying audience that you like your own products or services if you don't like your stuff it's gonna be really hard for you to make a case and make them believe that you like it so having had access to the internet for their entire lives, everything in these people's lives is entertainment because they can deliver content directly to the palm of their hand. These are people that understand feedback and they need to speak to others that understand and address feedback in a reasonable amount of time. If this is going to be a conversation between two people, then you need to make sure that the feedback is not from a point of being defensive. If you're going to be authentic and the things that you say are true, then you don't have a reason to be defensive. You're simply having a conversation on what the thoughts or ideas of your buyer are. So you should be able to metaphorically be able to rub elbows with the group of influencers and purchasers. But when it's time for you to take the punch, take it with a smile on your face. Building a brand means that you are also having to build the metaphor of the brand. So that means that part of the character that you build for your business is to build a character, to build the mythology, your origin story, the members of the team and the roles that they play in the story that you tell, and to be able to show that all of the participants in that story that you build have character. To be able to do that, don't create a character without telling that team member what character they play. Make sure that they are on board and that they are able to play that character in their private life and in their public life. When someone walks up and they expect to talk to Joe, the, the guy that makes the coffee, and they read about Joe for a week on Facebook, and they want to be part of the inside, and they try an inside joke with Joe that Joe doesn't know about, your entire mythology and story falls apart. So if you're going to build strong characters and you're going to build a image of your brand that shows character, make sure that your entire team is part of that story that you're telling. Be able to be nimble, be able to be noble in every action that you take. If you need to pivot or you need to take the higher ground, lose the sale, but preserve the brand and be nice. Everybody's watching and it doesn't cost you anything to be nice. And you would be surprised how much 
that the influencers are going to take note and share your story. Those characters that you built, the character that you have developed, the roles that you play. When you're able to be nice and show that you're nice and to be noble in the face of adversity, others are going to tell your story for you. They will become your influencers because of your actions. How do you sell to them? Well, <laughs> don't. Just don't, don't sell to them. Sell for them. Once you create that, that relationship, then you're going to be at a point where they're going to give you buying cues. And believe it or not, if you, if you are going to be talking to these people on Facebook or Twitter, they're going to be looking at photos of your business. They're going to be looking at photos of the faces in the photos that you share. If you guys go out and do a special event in your community, a business expo, a back to school event, you're going to want to take a lot of pictures. This is a visual generation. So when you do that and they get to know the people that are on your team, make sure that they feel like they're going to be able to recognize you. And when they come in your business, they're going to know a lot more about you if they're researching you than you think that they do. So just assume that they're further along in the sales process than you are. That gives you a point of a presumptive sale. If they're there and they're interested and they're looking you in the eye, they're probably further at a point where they're going to be able to make a decision right there at the, at the front gate. So just learn over time how to translate the conversations that they're having with you as a final step of sales instead of a point where they're going to be gathering information or doing a research in person. So to be able to market to this group of 18 to 34 year olds, here's what, here's what we need to start doing. We need to create zones where influencers can congregate. If you don't already dominate one of those social media platforms, and I'm not saying that you have to be in the top 10% of the audience that's there, but if you're not already there and you're not already pretty good at being in one of those social media networks, you need to figure out how. And the easiest way to do that is to find an influencer, build a position of trust, ask them probing questions, and have them help you. People like helping people. We, we're social mammals, so exploit that. When you're creating the story, when you're creating the mythology, you have to do a little bit of research here about the difference, differences between extroverts and introverts. You want a brand that is able to have a good time. You want a brand to, to demonstrate extroverted behavior. But if you're researching, you're doing so as, as an introvert. You are sitting at home in your underwear and you're buying your materials on Amazon or you're doing your research about where you're going to buy your next, your next uh, zero turn radius mower. You may end up looking at dozens of different businesses, but all but the one that is going to be the target for you to go in and start the final part of the sales process is going to be forgotten. Uh, pretty much as soon as you discard that as a potential place of purchase, that is, a, that is a forgotten interaction. So you as a brand developer need to think like an extrovert. Be as conversational as possible in the forum, but be able to narrow that conversation once you get to the point where you're looking at the sale, be able to treat that person as an introvert. Remove as much noise as possible, remove as much external influence as possible, assume that they've got money in their pocket and they want to sign paperwork today because that's why they're there. And when you are able to put together your package of services or you're, put, you're putting together the package that is going to be the thing they purchase, that zero turn radius mower, be able to add something that demonstrates that you have feelings or emotion. In, in that moment. So be able to connect with that person one-on-one, -on -one. be able to establish some way to check in with them so that you maintain a feedback mechanism. Emotionally invest yourself in the sale, I guess is the best way of saying that. When you are researching, when you are developing that network, you want to reach that top 10% of the customers and find that their influencers. So the bottom of that form where we ask you to write down names and influencers and then write down the networks where they are, that's where you're gonna begin your research. That's where you're going to be the introvert looking at what extroverted messages those people are putting in what they share with their, their networks. 
you'll use the same channels that they do to see who their network is. You're just going to be able to see the same kinds of names come up uh, time after time. And you're going to see what language and what style of uh, what style of, of messages are going to engage that person. If you see their threads, if you see what their influencers or their friends are doing, then you'll be able to you'll be able to see how to dress for the dinner. Entertainment is a currency. You know these these people have been entertained by the device in their hand. They play games at work. They play games while they're waited at stoplights. They read their messages from their social media channels all the time, from the time they wake up to the time that they go to sleep. So that device is showing them information all the time. Device, the device delivers the entertainment. The ability to share the entertainment is where you build currency in your network. So be able to provide high value content and be able to base the rewards when you have a sale from a buyer and you want to engage them on a second sale or on follow up sales, you know, come back and see us when you need parts, make sure that the rewards are based on what the desired second action is. You've already got their money. You've already got the sale. Make sure that you have some sort of reward mechanism so that you've emotionally invested in getting them back in the door or getting them engaged in your network or getting them to be an influencer to other buyers who may be in the same market that they are. Your feedback mechanisms, um, the, the folks that we're asking you to gather on the back of your form, your feedback mechanisms need to be able to be desirable and they need to be usable for those folks. Part of dominating those social media channels is that you need to be able to use those feedback mechanisms so that you're gathering information that helps you make reasonable decisions on developing your next marketing plan. A SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, pretty much everybody that's on, on our presentation today, you're gonna know what that means because that's one of the basics of marketing metrics. Well, you're going to be able to do SWOT almost in real time based on what your customers are saying about you on Facebook or Twitter. So the conversations that you create with your purchaser during that sales process, if it happens instantly or it happens over the course of a couple of hours or days, make sure that everything that you say is crafted in such a way and not in an evil way. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want you to think that you have to, dig some sort of underground communications laboratory and buy a white cat and a leather chair. This is not a 007 movie. The conversations that you are creating need to always be framed in a position that you're creating a relationship first. You, you are desiring the influence of this buyer as much as you are desiring the sale of this buyer. While you're developing these targets, this is something that, that, um, really helps you cut through the effort and chaff. Remember the rule of the 14 year old, and this may be a note that you want to write down right now, because we're going to spend pretty much the rest of the presentation on that. The 14 year old person is the most, um, it, it is an age at which you are of your highest influence. You're, you are a high school freshman. Okay. So 14 years old. If you, if you think about where you are now, you probably have, a favorite all-time band, a favorite all-time movie, a favorite all-time food, and a favorite all-time person, all of whom are probably within a year and a half of when you were 14 years old. So either just before you entered your eighth grade year of middle school or just before you got your driver's license, you, your taste making was formed on music, movies, food, people by the time you were 14 years old. I'm going to explain a little bit of context for that in just a little bit. So earlier when I said you need to be able to do some research on um, pop culture of 1995 through 2014, one of the ways for you to be able to funny, for one of the best ways for you to be able to be funny when you are engaging social audiences is to be able to use pop culture memes are huge on Facebook and Twitter, right? Well, a lot of that is based on pop culture references that go back through the last 20, 25 years. So just do a little bit of research. You know, IMDB is your friend. 
uh, Wikipedia top movies of 1995, 96 and on, those, those are going to be your friends to be able to do a little bit of research about what people were talking about when they were 14 years old. So when you're doing that, let's go back, let's go back to what the cultural influences were 20 years ago. If you were a 14 year old in 1998, that means that you are 34, you're on the high end of our 18 to 34 target, right? If you uh, were a freshman in high school in 1998, chances are one of your favorites artist is gonna be Shania Twain or Celine Dion, Third Eye Blind, depending on where you are between the uh, country, pop, and rock influences that were on radio at the time. Your, the movies that you got to see and that your friends talked about were probably Armageddon, Saving Prior, Private Ryan. Um, if you are in your 30s, Saving Private Ryan may even be a movie that is in your permanent Amazon queue or that you have it on Blu-ray somewhere. Chances are that in high school, that you and your friends ate gorditas from Taco Bell. You remember the little Taco Bell dog, Yo Quiero Taco Bell. You remember when Burger King made a big deal that we're serving breakfast and we've got mini cinnamon rolls. I know that that a couple that um, Buffalo doesn't have a Burger King, but if you came down to Springfield so that you could cruise with the kids in Springfield, then maybe these were foods that you tried. Your, your, uh, your famous person that you look up to from that period, Helen Hunt, Tom Hanks, someone from the Titanic, you probably are still mad at Rose because she didn't move over to let Jack on the piece of wood, right? We're never going to settle that. Jack was going to die. It was all part of her losing the big blue stone. We weren't going to be able to be romantic for the Titanic. The ship is gone. We need to get over it. It's 20 years ago. We got to move on. If you go back 10 years earlier, if you are the generation that is removed from that, if you were the high school freshman when these people were um, not even born yet, if you were the high school senior when these kids were in kindergarten, then you probably remember Whitney Houston, George Michael, Michael Jackson. You remember quoting lines from Rain Man or Crocodile Dundee in high school. You remember Alf on 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 a TV or playing McDonald's Monopoly for the first time. Uh, we probably remember before Bill Cosby was evil and he was misusing Jello pudding pops, right? So that's what was happening in, in high schools 30 years ago. So you can see the difference. If we go back a step, you can see the differences in all of the players and all of the references and all of the things that are going to be at the top of mind, things that you've been reinforcing since you were giggling about them in the halls of your high school, you're going to see how different that is. Well, let's move forward 10 years. This is the cultural reference that is still quasi-current. This is what's being talked about by people that have just graduated from colleges or they are, they are um, settling on their first purchase of their home. They're settling on long-term contracts for cell phone services. They're looking for plumbers because they bought a home and they didn't realize that the hot water heater was a leaker, right? So if you're talking to say 25 year olds, then you need to be able to be uh, culturally relevant with Katy Perry, Pink, Flo Rida. These are still names that are being played on current radio. Uh, the Dark Knight was a huge movie. Iron Man was a huge movie. Batman and all of the Fantastic Four universe, still relevant. Will Ferrell, Adam Sandler, Queen Latifah, these are still people that are starring in current movies. So if you've got a kid or a grandkid that knows anything about any of these people, throw money at them, throw free food at them, they're gonna be great at helping you find influencers. So these are larger cultural references to be aware of for people that are younger than 34 years, or people that, yes, are younger than 34 years old. These are people that turned 20 the day that the planes hit the Twin Towers. So everything before, everything that they remember uh, is getting really cloudy at this point, um, almost 20 years later. They've only known how to talk on wireless devices. They never had a phone in the house that had a coiled cord, unless they were at grandma's house or unless they come over to my house because I've still got one of those phones because I love my wired phone. I'm 47, don't you judge me. 
These are people that have always known user-generated video. There has always been YouTube. They have always been able to shoot something on their phone, upload it, and share it with their friends. Always, always, always. So they are very visual, and they are very moving video savvy. If you can make your brand and make your mythology into a video, even if the technology is terrible, if it's funny and they like it and they like you, they're going to share it. And they're going to share it because they've only known a multi-channel content world. They've, they've always had 30 radio stations. They've always had 500 television stations. They've always had a thousand choices for digital media. And they've always been able to choose from 60,000 songs on iTunes. They've never known a world where they were limited by the choices that they make. And this includes the choices that they are researching about you and your business. So they're a lot further along about knowing about you. And they're a lot further along about being able to research you before you ever meet. Be aware of that because this, right here, this slide is where these folks have come from. So when we get to the point of talking about what are going to be our best practices to be able to start a conversation with them, this is where you're going to want to take some notes. And we've got the second sheet of the printout of the, the brief that has the slides on it. These are going to be the notes that guide you over the next 90 days. So we encourage you to use what you did with your worksheet, the channels that you already know and that you understand that you can influence, and the folks that you want to influence. We encourage you to use that information to start work in the next 90 days on this set of best practices. And the, that is to be ready 24-7. If you don't have a Facebook for Business, get one. If you don't have a Twitter and somebody that is going to at least check Twitter once a day, it takes 10 seconds. Get one. Know, to, know how to have conversations that build trust. You don't have to sell to these people. They are already researching. When they get to the point where they are ready to be a buyer, you want to be able to make enough of a value statement that they're going to choose you instead of someone outside your market in a larger retail center or going to Amazon. And the way that they're going to be able to do that is that they know that they can trust you. If it breaks, they don't have to ship it back. If it breaks, they can buy parts at your business. If it breaks, they're going to know that you know somebody that's going to tell them how to make it work again. That is the power of the influence. So those conversations that you create with the influencers help you build trust because you're helping them build the network. And when you're having that conversation, because again, you are, you are an introvert talking to an introvert, make sure that you are present. Make sure that you reduce the amount of noise. To be able to be present, you gotta be able to listen to what they're saying and you've gotta be able to translate it into a statement or solution that says that you heard what they said. So when you're able to ask probing questions or you're able to restate for clarification, you're going to be able to know that they are giving you a buying signal and they're going to be able to know that you're receiving the buying signal. So that's going to be able to relax them to, do, to build trust that you guys are on the same page at the same moment. The best way to ask a probing question is to flank a question with a question. So did you mean this? or that. So you want me to be able to do this and that's going to get the, the set of things that you need done. That's a question. So you're not, you're, you're not making a statement. You're not making a presumption. You're asking a question because again, you want to make sure that they trust you enough that you are both in the same mode of conversation. When you're able to get that information through hearing what they're actually asking, then you can offer a feature or benefit that has not previously been part of the conversation. That's going to show that you care about them as a buyer, and that's going to build emotion into the trust equation. And you're going to be able to take that clarification, and you're going to be able to triangulate other influencers. So do you know so-and-so? I was able to do this for them. Is that kind of what you're asking me about? I know that you like tacos and that you really like stopping on Elliott Street when you go to Aurora. Does that mean that you want to go to El Taco Zone? It absolutely does. There is never a time that I don't want El Taco Zone. I'm going to leave Harrison, Arkansas when I'm done with this and I'm going to drive directly to Aurora because I'm that kind of person that loves Mexican food that much. So instead of showing someone something, you want to tell them. I'm sorry, instead of telling someone something, yes, we can do this. You want to show them, this is what we've done. The easiest way to do that is to take lots of pictures and to have video that is your case maker. 
You want to have as much information about the things that you've done, what makes you cool and what makes you trustworthy as possible and be as visual as possible. And you want to be able to show that you don't have a standard order, that you can make something special. We've all seen these things that are shared on Facebook or Twitter of the custom paint job or the new wheels or the cool thing that the business did because they really care about their customers. That's what makes that content valuable. And in your research, what these people want, you're going to know where they're researching. You're going to know where your competitors are because you're constantly doing your SWOT analysis. If you can build emotion, you're going to build that by sharing that you feel things as a brand or that you touch people as a brand. This is an age group that values experiences. So if you can create a great experience, that story is part of the entertainment that they share. That story that they share is entertaining their influencing group. That influencing group is going to find value, which is the currency in the entertainment. You see how all of this is coming around full circle? The experience is entertaining. The entertainment is a currency. The method of communication is the banking system of that entertainment currency. So always speak to people, not of the things that you're doing, to the people that you are feeling for or that you are touching through your actions or by adding value. And all of the mythology of your brand is going to be based on those authentic, verifiable experiences. So the dopamine that they, when, when they are feeling rewarded, their brain is going to reward them with dopamine. So everything that you're doing, research dopamine, everything that you're doing, if it's not hitting a dopamine trigger, you're wasting time. You know what also hits my dopamine trigger? El Taco Zone in Aurora, Missouri. So while you're talking to these people, understand that Things move fast in their world. That Things move a lot faster in the world than they move in our world. So love fast. Break up early. Don't chase them. Cultivate the leads, sometimes through triangulation if you have to. But if you are an influencer before you move on to your next lead, they're going to add capital to you. They're going to add currency to you, and they're going to keep you in their pocket. They may have liked your page and forgotten about it. But when they get to the point where they need your product or service, they're gonna to go to the things that they have liked first. So influence before you move on. That's how you build loyalty. Make sure that all of your feedback mechanisms and metrics uh, help you do the thing that you gotta do regardless of the form of marketing. Track your leads, do your follow-up, make sure that you remove as much noise from the interactions as you can and reduce anxieties in the purchasing process. Make this as easy as possible. This is the hard one. And you got to get people that you trust and you got to reach out to influencers, create content, be active, whichever of those channels on that worksheet that you feel like is going to be the, the fort that you build is going to be the universe that you inhabit. Make sure that you are active there and make sure that you create content that is meaningful. Funny is entertaining. Entertainment is currency. And make sure that you start a conversation where sales is closer to the last step of the interaction than it is on the first step. When they're interested, they're gonna to come to you. That's the way these people work. So keeping the conversation alive by engaging with content is gonna be the way that you keep your brand alive and fresh. So our best practices at this point are you gotta be present, which means that you got to be active as you can be active in those channels. You've got to be active by being engaging You've got to be ready. When they're ready to make a sale, they're ready right now. And if you're not ready right now, they've already researched competitors that are available right now. So be ready right now. And be competitive by being ready right now. When your competitors have not been ready, you may be the third choice. But if you're the choice, it doesn't matter if you're the third choice or you're the sixth choice in their research, you're getting the money, the competitor is not and every dog wants the biscuit. So if you have to take the biscuit away from the other dog, you get to eat today, the other dog doesn't. Be available. Being available means that you're gonna be available when that person walks up or that person walks up in the grocery store or that person private messages you at nine, in the, nine, nine o'clock at night and says, hey, I'm sorry to bother you, but I've got this question, do you know anybody? And it may be something that they don't have any desire for your business, but they have a desire to know if you have an idea for influencers to be able to solve. Because again, 
content is currency. So that is a heck of a lot of information that we've gone through in a very short amount of time. Are there any questions? Thank you, Tim. That was incredible. Uh, really appreciate your uh, commentary. Uh, why don't we go one place at a time? So if all of you could be thinking about potential questions, we hope that you do have some interesting questions for Tim. Let's start, let's start in, um, in Buffalo. So Tanya, let me open up on your side and see if you guys have any questions. All right, um, I have a couple questions, if you can hear me. Yep. Okay. Um, you mentioned and on this sheet there's a lot of social media companies that we could choose from. Um, with so many platforms, can you recommend the top two or three that we might focus on? Um, you, you definitely want to make sure that the content on Facebook for Business is ready right now. If you don't have Facebook for Business and the content's not accurate, and you would be stunned at how many of these Facebook for Business identities that we look at that have no business hours, the wrong business hours, wrong phone numbers, wrong websites, check yourself out now. If, if it's wrong, then you're sending people elsewhere or you're not engaged enough to know that your business is up to date on Facebook, what else are you failing at? You're, you're creating fear, uncertainty, and doubt for your buyer. Um, if you are a service-based business or a restaurant, there's lots of places that give feedback so make sure that your feedback is addressed on platform, platforms like Yelp and all of the ones that are like them. Make sure that anything that offers you a free business listing is um, at least accurate. So when they check to see if you actually exist as a business and you get generally good feedback and they can feel that they can trust making a purchase with you that they're getting good information. So it really depends on the person on your business, but Facebook for business, definitely yes. Yelp, definitely yes. Twitter, if you've got the time and you know that your audience is gonna find value in it. All right. And so the other question is... Um, Hi, Sherry. Hey, Tim. <laughs> Uh, the other question is, um, with all these examples that you've given us for the different social medias, can you give us some examples of companies that are doing a great job? Um, in Buffalo specifically, Anna Johnson does a fantastic job. She takes pictures of inventory, she is available to talk to her audience, and she seems very personal. Now, I happen, I happen to know her enough in real life that I know that the person that she is on social media is authentic, but she works really hard. That is, that is not easy work that she does. She works really hard to keep those content channels fresh and to keep that content engaging. And I bet if you talk to her, it pays financial dividends. Um, if you do research about the Wendy's Twitter, they, these are people that have decided that Hey, depending on the day, we're the number three, number four, number five fast food chain. So we got nothing to lose. We're going to have fun with our social media outlet. So research those guys. Um, really, Southwest Airlines, they, they seem to have a good time with their social media accounts. You, you've got nothing to lose as long as, as, long as you know your, um, your network well enough to know that you generally got the same sense of humor, I say go for it. Very cool. All right. Thank you, That's Tanya. All I got, so. Thank you. All right. Um, Shannon and Aurora, let's go to you guys. Any questions? Um, I do have one. When you say, I mean, because I think we're all of us sitting in here are very authentic people. What what other things can we do to prove to these millennials that we are authentic? I mean, I'm raising one, mine's 18, so I, I kind of get where you're coming from, but for some people who, who maybe don't have an 18 to 34 year old right in their close circle, what more can we do to become authentic to them? Um, are, are, you guys, are you guys old enough to remember the lyrics to the uh, TV show, The Facts of Life, you take the good, you take the bad, you take them both. And wasn't Mrs. Garrett great? 
So uh, if you can be authentic in your daily life, if you can be at peace with the person that the universe made from you at the age of 14, and you can show the world that some days are great and some days are not, but I roll with the changes, that's a great way to be authentic, to show the reality of the life that you experience or that the brand experiences. And if you can develop a relationship with other brands that are close by, like let's say you had, oh, I don't know, if you had a local taco trailer located on the Elliott Street that served delicious burritos, and you could develop a relationship where your business and that business could tease each other on social media, that would be a idea for the two of you to show that you're authentic. You've got a brand that loves Mexican food and they've got a brand that loves whatever your business or service is and you're part of this little group of friends. And the folks that are lurking in the back that wanna be part of that virtual dinner party are gonna like seeing two friends tease each other. That's teasing and comedy, um, they're hard to do, but once you figure out a way to do it effectively, that's a great way to build rapport and show people that you are living your honest self. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions uh, in Aurora, Shannon? That's it? Okay, great, thank you. All right, let's go to Salem. Um, Tabitha, any questions? Wait one sec, hold on. I'm unable to unmute you guys. Can you see what's going on? While we're getting that fixed, let's go to uh, Marshfield. One sec. Hello? Yep. All right, Casey, we can hear you, go ahead. Okay, so my question is, how do you find that line between being intrusive and not intrusive to get your audience to engage. Do you have any tips on that? Um, if it feels wrong, it is wrong. Okay. If, if you know your buyers well enough to know that if I were in their shoes, this would feel creepy, it's creepy. Okay. So at the moment that you feel like you've gone one step too far, you're going one step too far. Okay. But again, every business is different. Every brand is different. You guys, it, when when you start with that one person, and that's the reason the, the worksheet is structured the way it is. When you start with, this is my 100% person, the, my, Grey's Anatomy, my Grey's Anatomy customer, you are my person. That, that person and the people that are part of that person's team of influencers, that's the personality that you research first. So if it feels like it fits for that group and you're throwing a dinner party for that group, then it fits. If it doesn't, then you're either spending way too much time agonizing over it or you're wasting time with it. So go on to something else. Okay. Thanks. Anything else, Casey? Um, that's it. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Salem, did we figure out our muting situation? I'm not sure what's going on. We're unable to mute you, unmute you. Do you, uh, if you have a question, you can also type it in in the chat box, if that's easier. We're having some sort of a technology issue. Okay, so while we figure that out, um, we're reaching the top of the hour. So uh, if, I, if you haven't already done so, uh, please take a few minutes to fill out your feedback. Really, truly, this your insights on what you liked about today's topic. Um, and as you think about potential future topics, um, more things, less things you want us to cover, even the structure of how this event went today, uh, we welcome your, your, your insights on all of those pieces. Reminder again, our next conversation is on the 20th of, um, of September. The topic will be ethics uh, in workplace and how to avoid potential legal situations. And also, um, if you're interested in joining the book club, um, uh, do let us know. Okay, I've seen a question coming in from Salem. Let me just see what it is real quick. So, okay, perfect. Well, with that, um, Tim, uh, thank you so much, but please, uh, any, any final thoughts 
tips for, for our listeners today, something that they can do as a next step to bring all this content to life? Well, the, um, the example that I used was purposefully tongue in cheek. I, I really do happen to love El Taco Zone, <laughs> but I want to show you that it is really easy to have a good time and to become an, an influencer. I have spent less than 90 seconds espousing the virtues of handcrafted Mexican food. That's an example of one brand and one guy that is really passionate about one thing, and it took 90 seconds. So if you can use that as an example, as weird as it is and as fixated as I get on good food, if you use that as one example, think about how that applies to your business and building that team, your group of folks that are going to become your passionate top 10% buyers and are going to influence your next 10% buyers. Because if you can work that churn, if you can keep 20% that are super passionate, the next 20% is going to be super easy. And then it's just about working growth and, and introducing yourself to the new people. Great. Well, Tim, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot just for a minute. Um, if, if some of our uh, attendees had some follow-up questions and they wanted to reach out to you, uh, could you, would you be comfortable sharing your email address and you don't have to respond right away whenever uh, you have a moment, I know you're very busy, but it'd be wonderful if our, some of our attendees just knew how to get a hold of you so they could bounce some ideas off of you. Would that be okay? Would you be comfortable with that? Absolutely. It's El Taco Zone Dude. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. It is support, this is the email address that comes directly to me, support at philipsmedia.com. And that's P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S-M-E-D-I-A.com. Just like Philips 66, support at philipsmedia.com. Great, thank you. And then chamber leaders, if you could please collect those responses and uh, send them over, we can consolidate our, our, our findings. With that, we'll wrap up and hopefully we'll see you in a month. Take care, everyone. Have a good day.